Hello. The light's blinking and the numbers are moving. Oh, it looks like we're live. All right. Um, I'm Verde Arbusto. This is a. Um, it is. Uh, it's almost midnight into the eighth, um, which would be Tuesday, I believe, of September, uh, 2020. Um, yeah, we all get glasses. Uh, so, um, so. Uh, it's continuations, part 10 of the series, this long winding data forensic, data reconstruction of uh, the machine at Tomsk. What has there then happened? Um, and so I've, I've gone through um, a number of concepts when working with information systems and computers, uh, the safe mode, um, hot swap. Uh, and well, I got the, the last video, um, got, I was in, where, wa watching it and it got kind of cut off. So, um, so I'm going to pick up where that, um, left off because it's, it's not quite done yet. And I wanted to go over some important concepts with y'all at the end of it. Um, so I'm going to let this. And this is a good data point reminder of what what we're we're looking at relative to to capture of the human human system of resonances. Okay, so um, that having said, I'm going to pause this. Um, I just realized I'm out of coffee, so and then from that point forward, I'm going to finish the uh, the video. So uh, bear with me. Thank you. Hello, okay. <laughs> Lights are flashing, numbers going. We're moving. All right. Um, okay, so my coffee's done. Good. Machine's back off. All right, okay. So, I'm um, picking up. This is 10. I know it's another part because I had to do another one of these uh, thumbnails. Um, and um, hopefully we're moving along kind of at a pace that's not boring anyone. And yet is also at a pace that's, you know, where you can get what's happening. You know, I'm taking a scenic route because I'm I'm trying to keep in mind, the, you know, the beginners and newcomers here and people that are, you know, kind of freshly in this and that there's a learning curve, you know, there is a steep learning curve. But here this this gentleman is, is in this case, taking us through the, the process and very simple, e easy to... C, I guess. Uh, you know, you just see boxes with labels on them, switches. Okay, you know, but there's not many. Um, uh, and and so here is a, a gentleman who is an antenna maker, an antenna builder, and these are are folks, the independent of of Tomsk, Tomsk uh, observatory in Russia. Who are showing us how they they they, they, they to put together an antenna system, a uh, detector system uh, for the human resonances, and in this case, showing you some complications that are coming from uh, adding a source of resonance. Okay, at five, he's getting you know he moves it up. I'm sorry, up to thirty. Uh, and you see he's getting other signals in there. All right. So, you know, this is uh, one of the... How do I put this? When you... There's a cause and effect. When you do one thing over here, you improve part of the... So this is something that we learned in, in, in computer tech, when you upgrade components that... Depending on how, oh, how do I say this? How close to the motherboard that you are, there are levels of hot swappability. You know, you can change, like I said, circuit breakers, and yet the whole panel at some point would need to be replaced and shut off. That gets shut off at the main, and that gets that's a long 
duration thing, while we take a week, you know, or three days, whatever, you know, depending on how, what kind of crew you got, you know, you can swap out, you know, if you're not rewiring any of, of the house, running new wires, you know, you can use what's there, but, um, you know, this takes, this takes time. And, and upgrades to a system can have unintended, you know, uh, results. All right. So I think that's what um, the best way to put that. That's kind of a summary of where we're at in things. All right. So um, let me let me entertain you. So I moved, had moved that back, back to uh, the time of 1313. Okay. I'm going to check my volume button here. It's almost 36 dBm. So there we are, we're transmitting at 5 hertz now. If I increase the frequency here, from five to something a little bit higher, like 30. You notice that as you go higher in frequency, the efficiency of the whole thing becomes a lot better. So the signal increases. Now we're getting a signal at 20 hertz. I don't know what's going on there, but possibly this uh, cheap Chinese um, signal generator is doing strange things, but there's the 30 hertz signal, quite strong. Yeah, let's move back out. There's the 30 hertz. Maybe if we turn the um, gain down a little bit more, it might improve those, uh, stop those other signals from appearing. No, it's still there. Okay, I don't know why it's doing that, but obviously the signal generator is doing a little bit of uh, strange stuff. Now, even down at these frequencies, you still have harmonics, so that 30 will produce a slight signal at 60, which you can just see, and it'll probably produce a stronger signal at about 90, which you can see there. So even this low in frequency, you still have harmonics to deal with, which is quite interesting. All right, so that, in a nutshell, is what I use to receive the Schumann resonance. And I might also add, too, for people that are interested in VLF and ELF and LF, um, there are actually signals uh, down this low on frequency. The Russians used to have some signals around 70 hertz. I don't know whether they still use those or not, but there are still some signals down in this very, very low range, uh, which are used for uh, navigation and maybe to pass data. Obviously, at these very, very low um, frequencies, I mean, if you've got a, a one hertz signal, you can't really modulate that in any way other than just turning it on and off like Morse code. And, you know, it's going to be very slow going to send, you know, a five or six... Uh, different dashes and dots when you have to wait one second at least between each each uh, on-off cycle in order to convey your little Morse code message. But uh, anyway, there you have it. I'll just turn that a little bit lower, maybe go down to about 15 and we'll wait for the spectrum to come down. And there's your signal at 15. So I hope you guys all found this, uh, look at the color of the, uh, when you point the phone at the computer screen and then you point it at something else, the color balance is completely wrong. But anyway, there's my little experiment. As you can see, I've only got the antenna down a little bit. Now, in the next couple of days, I'm gonna do something more interesting and that is I'm gonna leave this thing connected at about, say, 10 hertz. 5 hertz, and then take the laptop, sound card, the notch filter, and that front end, I'll take it down to the local park, which is about maybe 300 meters away from here, 
approximately. I'll take it to the park and 400 meters and I want to see if I can receive my 5 hertz signal from the park, which I should be able to do, I'm guessing. Uh, if I increase the gain on that, pull that antenna out fully to uh, about seven or 70 centimetres, maybe even use the longer antenna. Uh, I'll also be in the middle of a park which is away from, uh, there'll be still 50 hertz there, but much less than what there is here in the radio room. And uh, I should be able to receive my signal over 400 metres. And if that's the case, well, I'll be happy. If not, well, bad luck. But I will be taking this receive system in the next month or two up to a, one of the highest mountains we have here in this part of Australia um, for a couple of days and try to receive the Schumann residence up there, record it all, get some video of it, and then um, hook up my other uh, mini whip antenna and receive some uh, your typical VLF stuff like the Alpha, the Russian Alpha signals and a few other uh, submarine comms type stuff and record it all to have a bit of fun. I'll spend a couple of days up there basically and, and uh, do, do this sort of stuff. All this that's happening on the spectrum is because I'm physically moving around here so you can't have any kind of movement when you're doing this. Any, anything moving anywhere in the, you know, in the vicinity of the antenna will cause that spectrum to, to uh, jump up and down. So it makes a very good movement detector as well. So I've got to pick a day when it's not windy. Anyway, thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed. Take care. Oh, I enjoyed immensely. Thank you. Right. Make sure to give him full credit. All right. And so uh, this is um, Jam Digital. Go over. Show him some love. I should probably subscribe. There you go. All right. So... Um, and all the other <laughs> fine and fun stuff on YouTube. All right. So we are on a discussion about uh, what he was um, uh, so So, if we move it forward, I just want to show you where, where we talk about the notch filter. The sound cut. So, when the ADC in the sound cut is overloaded, you start to get all kinds of weird effects and images and things. So, to avoid that, I need to stop that from overloading. So what I'm going to do is, I'm gonna to have to stop the video again, but I'll place a 50 hertz notch filter in line between the front end and the sound card. And that'll, that'll block 50, well, it won't block it fully, but it'll, it'll attenuate the 50 hertz considerably and stop the sound card ADC from being overloaded, which will help in our little experiment here. So I'll do, I'll stop the video and I'll do that now. Connect that up. Okay, we're back. There you go. We're back. All right. So, um, it did not take him to have to shut off the computer, the main system there, to to reduce you know to get the filter to reduce the the uh, the noise. And I have said this before about Tomosk Tomsk that they're getting all these lines, straight lines, lower harmonic frequencies at one, two, f five, six, like striations. Those are, I'm, I'm suggesting those are local, and if they're looking to filter those out because of the noisy local environment that they're at, they, you can have the rest of the system on, be on, and in a safe mode and and change your filter without having to change the main system down. However, as you saw, it was not without its problems. That 
you now, um, when you add something to the system, you are, you are creating additional complications. All right, so that would be a reason, and I had talked about, by analogy, the circuit breaker at my mother's house growing up in, in Connecticut, uh, that, you know, at a certain point, the weather would get in, and we are left with, you know, having to replace the whole uh, box. And then, well, hey, while we're upgrading, it's, we're also going from 50 amps to 100 amps. You know, we need to upgrade the, 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 the system as well. And as, as you, 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 you saw, we brought up the example of hot swappable and the USB as the, um, the, 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 the system, the 32-bit system, allowing you to have an architecture that you can do the hot swap. You know, rather than the parallel where you had to shut it down, everything had to all start uniformly. In the case of the hot swap, you have two, a serial, serial data, allows you to have, you know, four pins, two of which are negative, those engage first, and then you have the, the positive data at that point, it start, it's just hits the ground running, you know. But it's not until the 32-bit architecture, you know, on the USB they showed you, uh, where you're moving from, you know, 16-bit, the parallel is 16-bit, and the serial is four bits, so they've cut it down into a quarter. So, because there's less of a need to have it all be, um, what is it called, all of the data, when you have parallel, all of the data has to get there at exactly the same time, it all has to move exactly at the same time, there's a lot in maintaining that. Whereas if you go up to the 32-bit system, which is where Windows 95 technically starts. Windows 98, if you remember that, I remember it. I still like Windows 98. I don't care what y'all say. Um, I'd have a copy of it if I still had all my software. Um, don't scoff. Don't judge. Um, there's nothing wrong with it. Um, uh, you know, um, so, uh, you know, so depending on you know, which is, that's where it starts getting into the hot swap, you know, is Windows 98, 95, that, that whole system, all right, um, all right, so I'm at 17 minutes, on this. all right, so, um, uh, where are we at, all right, so, okay, so, I had wanted to, in some last video, before I forget, there is, a, there's an introduction to, not that, <laughs> I gotta remember where everything is. I had so much stuff onto here. I, I, my browser is so clogged up with stuff. All right. Um, so there we are. All right. So by way of introduction, uh, the um, this is the central. Italian Electromagnetic Network, C-I-E-N, 10 years after the beginning of continuous monitoring. All right, so this was in, you know, January, I'm sorry, that's not January, that's November 2016. At that point, it was 10 years of then, you know. Uh, uh, so this is a conference, paper, this is a conference, apparently, in at least. All right, so they're talking about that. I will give the the links in the ring, the the, the links in my description. All right. So I'm just going to read this real quick. I, I don't even want to read the fir whole first paragraph. I just like the first sent two sentences. I think so. It's essential Italy uh, electromagnetic e network CIEN ten years after the beginning of continuous monitoring. This is Cristiano. Fed, Fid, Fidani. All right, and this is Sarah Electronics Instruments. All right. Over the last decade, major earthquakes have occurred throughout Italy, leading to deaths and extensive damage. Three of these earthquakes have reached the threshold of six, about one every three years. 
causing over 600 deaths. Many reinforced concrete structures have collapsed. All this, despite oh, sorry, despite repeated appeals, despite repeated appeals to build. Despite repeated appeals um, to build anti-seismic constructions and carry out restorations following stringent laws that were promulgated in order to avoid repeating sorry, the disasters of the 20th century. Can the restoration of structures serve as a real solution for avoiding more Italian casualties? Uh, all right. This is the first time I'm actually reading this. All right, so this is one of the things they do. This, is, this was not what I wanted to talk about. You know, but they monitor, these guys monitor uh, earthquakes. All right, now, all right, this was, this was the fun part. All right, so this is a website, Wix. All right, and I'll leave the link in the description. C-F-I-D-A-N-I dot Wix site dot com slash cn slash research all right so now this is we're starting to get to the um the candy and the pinata i i will call this all right so when we're talking about this was this i wanted to dedicate the last part of this the last two-thirds of this last one to alternate sources of information of where to get your you know both the magnet magnetometer part and the electrics are two separate deals so there's a lot of places around the world, around the globe, that measure the magnetics and not the electrics. All right, so hopefully in the last bit of this, we can go to skip across some of the other ones, places we have, and um, uh, we'll leave links in the description. All right, so uh, it says here, And this is under their research. I couldn't tell you how long it took to me took me to accidentally get lost into finding this gem of the site, but now it's yours because I love you all, especially you, wages. Uh, right, so electric. It says research electric. Right, hold on. Why do that? Oh, the luxury of coffee. Electric and magnetic detectors provide complementary information on electromagnetic phenomena, even if incomplete regarding their coupling with objects. Coupling with objects. I'm not sure what that means. CIEN was therefore equipped with meteorological stations and other instruments to measure the mobility of electric charges. Alright, now go over there, reading for yourself, see what you think of it. <clears throat> Thunderstorms. Rain is electrically cha charged. Rain. Rain is electrically charged. So when it strikes electrodes, it generates intense signals on the electrical apparatus. Typical electrical recordings are shown in the following pictures reporting spectrograms. All right, so it's a spectrogram. I keep calling it a spectrograph. It's a spectrogram. Right. Just, uh, just dig on how trippy it is. Right. Right. Says, all right, I'm at 24 minutes here. I'll just read a little bit of this, I think. A 2.5 hour recording of the ELF band of a couple of perpendicular electrodes for a thunderstorm. 
at the Camerino station of Siam in, uh, is shown in the figure above. The time evolution moves rightward on the plot. Being so, it is possible to see that the arrival of a thunderstorm, light blue, is precedented by a moderate rain event in blue associated with an increase in the spherics number of vertical lines. Such increases are determined by lightning bolts and inner cloud discharges that approach the station. When the rainfall begins, maybe that'll help. Rainfall begins at the Camerino station, a 30 decibel increase in power continuously fills the whole ELF band until the end of rainfall. This is due to the electromagnetic charge of raindrops striking the wire. The polarity of such charges change many times, as shown by the white-colored amplitude into the upper blue band. Note that the ELF band has a logarithmic scale. Strong meteorological Logical perturbations <laughs> all right thanks just killing time yeah. uh, perturbations strong meteorological perturbations can also influence the radio transmissions in ELF band here with a here with a linear scale. Okay. For example, this uh, <clears throat> I'm sorry, for example, this occurred in Karuga on the 27th of July 2011 in the early afternoon when an intense rainfall swept through swept the area as shown in figure on the right. In the spectrogram, which is relative to one electrode only. A high-intensity rainfall event is associated with ELF band in the bottom, where power increased to 50 decibels. The ELF is also shown on the is also shown on the top, where strong signals and are nearly absent. Sorry, uh, here one can observe the surprising differences of the signal at 16 kilohertz at about uh, 1635 local time, which is produced by the photovoltaic power supply and suggesting that the sun was obscured for some minutes by the intense precipitations. During the same time interval, the yellow bee belt, I think, fades as do the as do the carrier waves of several transmitters indicated by horizontal lines from Fidani 2011. Right. So I'm going to be running out of time soon. So I'm going to right. So that is um, research for a scene. All right. So there is space weathernews.com okay and this is from suspicious observer where he's giving you you know i'm not going to go into all of the the stuff of what all this fun stuff is but he has a source of um you know this is a source of information okay then you have spaceweather.com Okay, which does a little different something. Yeah, it's got cool graphics. All right, neat. Okay. Cosmic rays in the atmosphere, and they give you information there. Okay, so I'm just essential links. I'm just giving these guys a shout out. Okay. 
and then you have this is space weather live and that's giving you some information up to the moment around the world I've been here before I've uh, shown shown this I'm still working through it there's a stack pot of Europe okay and these are all this, the the latitudes uh, this is North America so I'm zipping through all this. I'd like you to go over there for yourself. You know, Wages World has frequently explains how things are, you know, put together uh, in the greater scheme of things. All right, now, Tomsk, I wanted to make it a point to show you. I have it in my back. All right, so this is where Tomsk is located in that part of the world. All right. And where the observatory is, I have it on my back, my, my wallpaper, you know, but you have, just want to make mention of this. You have, this is the, um, the schematic diagram of this. You have the, the, the polytech, and then you have the um, the other one. These up here somewhere. The SOS, the control system. It's somewhere, somewhere around here. Okay, I don't want to want to waste more time. I'm looking for it. Um, I have it bookmarked here. Oh, there it is. All right. So you see, there it is. It's in the same general area there. That's the the other one. All right. So they they were together. That was where the the first one was the Polytech, and that's where Tomsk University were there. Um, where the antennas, the Schumann antenna is one that everyone online pulls for as far as I can see, pulls from these guys right here, this complex. All right, so that's where you're getting your data from. All right, so now uh, that's the Russian, the Russian site is right there. All right, so this is uh, ingv.it. This is another Italian site, and they're giving you. Uh, I don't. I. Not sure what their relationship to the CEIN network is. All right, so we're at 33 minutes right now. Um, that um, where I'm going to be shut off very, very shortly. And then there's this fun thing here <clears throat> where it shows you. Oh, yeah, here. Where she talks about the dependencies of factor of merit were being quality. No, that's not what quality means, honey. All right. Thank you all for being here. Um, the thing hasn't shut off yet. Um, I like 3333 as the, uh, the time.